everyone, CPO here, and in this video, I'm going to talk about communications, uh, Jeep off-roading communications. I see it a lot, and, uh, and I've seen it more and more, particularly this spring for some reason, but a lot of people are asking, what radio should I get? And the answers tend to be the same regardless of the forum I see the question asked, and it's usually the person who's answering gives it the answer, the response from their perspective from the radio that they use, the people they hang out with, the location that they live, uh, they provide a perspective. Oftentimes, that recommendation is not a legal one. So, uh, what I wanted to do is put together a video that talks about the licensed and unlicensed options for radio communications, show you sort of the requirements, the rules, and then you can make a decision on whether or not you are willing to step outside those rules. A lot of people do. A lot of people will get a race radio, throw it in their Jeep, go talk to their buddies on the trail and will have zero problems. Or a Bofang uh, ham radio and without a license go out, run around and use it. Um, that doesn't make it right. And so if you're new and you're asking the question, what should I use? I think that the responsible thing to do is tell you what the requirements and the rules are, what your options are under those rules and requirements, and then let you decide where you want to venture off into. For example, I, I think of it like uh, window tent or oversized tires. Like a lot of us are running around with illegal tent and tires that extend past our fender uh, that's illegal on the street. We know that, we accept that risk. Most of us are gonna get away with it without a problem. Every once in a while, one of us is gonna get hung up. Um, I myself have been pulled over specifically for window tent, had to pull it off before, go get reinspected, put window tent back on, and now I'm reaccepting that risk. But it's not fair to a new person to say, do what I do, which is illegal, and, and not tell them that they have to accept risk when they do that. The biggest challenge as of late are the race radios, right? From uh, PCI and rugged radios, no offense to those companies, but they sell uh, radios that are pre-programmed with certain frequencies that it's not legal for me or you to use under most circumstances. So I'll explain that here in a minute. This is gonna be sort of a technical rulesy video, but I think it's important to at least let people know sort of what the options are and, and where the boundaries are. If you choose to step those boundaries, that's up to you. I will say this, uh, in, in looking at doing a UHF VHF communication style video, I actually contacted a ham radio uh, reseller and was like, hey, you wanna work with me? We can you know, help figure out how to best convey uh, responsible radio usage to uh, the off-roading community. And they were like, absolutely not. We don't wanna have anything to do with the off-roading community. You know why? Because our name is MUD. Because we are overstepping boundaries and rules and laws that other people work really hard to stay within. And the off-roading community lately has a reputation for not caring, disregarding. So that's one of the reasons this video is here to help educate you on responsible radio communications. You can decide how you want to pursue that. I'll always tell you the things I use and under what circumstances I use them. But the real answer, the real answer for what radio should I use, I would say start with the people you are gonna go wheeling with. Um, and it depends where you live. Like East Coast, we're almost exclusively CB radio still. West Coast, they've almost all transitioned to UHF, VHF, or the race radios. Legal or not, that aside, most people seem to be getting away from CB out there. Over here, almost nobody has a UHF VHF radio. If I wanna go on a convoy or a wheeling event with my local group, I've gotta have a CB in the Jeep because that's how they're communicating. So your first answer is always, who am I hanging out with and who do I wanna communicate with and what do they use? Start there and then figure out what licensing or equipment you need to make that happen. So anyway, let's get into this. Like I said, sorry, it's gonna be a little bit technical, um, but in between, I'll try and break it up and I'll show you the actual radios uh, that I have on hand that I use uh, for my communications. Let's do it. 
All right, guys, I'm going to break this down for you in a way that hopefully gives you a lot of information, but also translates between like FCC legalese and technical speak into something that's understandable from a practical perspective. So there are several realistic options for both licensed and unlicensed communications. So I'm going to go through these and, and I'm going to talk about them in some detail, but I'm going to use the FCC's website to show you the information. I'm not going to you know, go uh, reference Wikipedia or tell you what I heard from a friend who heard from a friend or talk about the common knowledge, and I'm using air quotes there, uh, that a lot of people tend to push around. I'm gonna start out by showing you the legalities, what radios and what equipment are legal under what circumstances. And then I'll talk a little bit about the practical use and how it's often used. So uh, first of all, let's, let's go through the list of things. And like I said, these are the most realistic options. There are other communications options out there, um, but these are the ones primarily that we would use as you know, normal people communicating with other normal people. And I use the term normal loosely. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, CB, now known as CBRS. Uh, by the FCC, Citizens Band Radio Service. And I'm just gonna go through the list first, and then I'll, I'll break down information about each one of these. Uh, next is Family Radio Service, FRS, then Multi-Use Radio Service, MERS, then General Mobile Radio Service, GMRS, then there's the Amateur Radio Service, which most people refer to as ham radios, and then there's Private Land Mobile Radio Services, or the business frequencies, which a lot of race radios use. And, uh, and then finally, there's Cellular Service. So, why would you use a cell phone over something else? Well, it depends on your needs. In a lot of places, a cell phone works fine, but the reality of it is in a lot of off-roading environments, there is no cell service, right? So uh, cell phones don't actually have signal to work. The other thing is um, a cell phone is sort of a one-to-one -one communication mechanism, whereas if you use CB, and uh, all 10 of your, your group are on the same CB channel, you can all communicate with each other as a group. It's kind of hard to do that with a cell phone. That's some of the reasons uh, why. And then there's you know, a couple of other reasons. For example, you can monitor other people's communication so that there are other wheeling groups around. You can listen in on what they're doing, figure out where they're going, where they're hung up at. You can use that to better plan your strategy for where you want to go next or where you don't want to go. If somebody has a call for help, they may broadcast that out and you may be able to monitor that and hear that and, uh, and respond and perhaps uh, help somebody. So there's a lot of reasons why two-way radio communications become a great asset uh, in, the, uh, in the field. All right, so I'm taking you to the FCC website. This is at FCC.gov. They have a pretty well laid out website to talk about these services. So if you know where to find them and what you're looking for, then, uh, then they have a lot of great information there. So my job in this video is to sort of throw that information at you, let you consume it, and then if you have more questions, you know where to go um, look. So uh, CBRS, this is what most people use, uh, CB radios. It's designed for private short distance voice communications. There are a, uh, the usual channels. If you look at the, the data section here, these are you know, channel one through channel 40 that everybody's used to. Behind those channels are actual frequencies that are assigned. A lot of people don't think about that, but these are, these are actually just frequency designations by the FCC. And then we all know that channel nine is reserved for emergency communications. Uh, police departments, highway patrol, all those sort of monitor nine. And then 19 tends to be the, uh, the trucker channel, the highway channel, uh, although that's uh, changed a lot, I think, over the years. Um, anyway, so that's where we're at with CB. There is no license requirement for CB. Anyone, regardless of age, can operate a CB station. Now, there are some rules about the equipment, but if you're not a foreign government, you're not a representative of a foreign government, and you haven't been previously shut down by the FCC, you can use a CB radio, which means any one of us can go into a truck stop or a Walmart or a Best Buy, buy a CB radio and use it. Pick a channel that all your friends are on and use it. And actually CBs are still quite common in a lot of areas. I know more and more the off-roading community is transitioning over to uh, UHF, VHF because of increased range or reliability. But a lot of people, particularly in the East Coast I know, 
a lot of the clubs and wheeling groups are still using CB because it's easily accessible by most people. It has a decent range and uh, yeah, it, uh, it just works. So um, there are some restrictions. For example, you can't mess with the output. Um, you can't transmit for more than uh, five minutes continuously without at least letting somebody else get in. Remember, these are shared channels. You can uh, have removable antennas. Uh, you can put as big of an antenna you want, uh, but there are some structural antenna regulations. You cannot put an amplifier in, uh, things like that. And you can pick your own handle. You don't have to use an FCC ID like N7 CPO. You can be like, hey, I'm Whiskey Tango Foxtrot and you know, I'm calling out the Wild Eagle. But uh, that's what makes it so easy. It's pretty much accessible. It is shared. So if somebody's using a channel that you wanted to use, um, you guys have to figure out how to play together. So usually it's the person that was there first wins and the next person goes to a different channel. Uh, but yeah, I mean, CB is, for a reason, the most popular usage. All right, guys, so for CB communications, I'm currently using this Uniden, uh, wow, it doesn't even say, I don't remember the model number. I'll put it up on the screen here. I actually did a review, a real short review video on it, and I really liked it. Um, it's discreet, it's got a small mic, um, and uh, you know all the controls are here on the head unit. The actual, transceiver part the brain is installed back behind the glove box so the only thing hanging out is this guy here i keep it hung right here next to my stereo on this jeep unique uh, cb hanger so for something like this you're going to need to not only install the radio but also install a cb antenna i happen to have one on the front bumper a lot of people put it on the back uh, tailgate or tire carrier uh, you can get a handheld CB radio, which works fairly well. Cigarette lighter adapter for power where you can use batteries. You can also add external antennas to those as well. They're all about the same power. And uh, you get a decent antenna with a good installation. They're all pretty much going to be usable. That's what I use. I actually used to have this guy. This, was, this is probably the most common CB radio in the Jeeps. It's the uh, 75WXST from Cobra. This one is very similar. The head is quite a bit bigger. That's because the actual transceiver like stuff, the guts are in here. And this, which goes back underneath the glove box, it's simply the, uh, the power and antenna connections. But all the, all the brains of the CB radio are right here. Whereas this one, the brains are actually, it's a bigger box. I can't show you because it's installed. Um, and this is basically just the push the talk button and then your controls and display. But that's CB. Where I live, everybody pretty much uses CB. So regardless of what my other options are available to me in the Jeep, I always have the CB. Now I don't run around with the CB on unless I'm out wheeling with people. There's very little value to me of driving down the highway listening to truckers. Um, if I tried it, it's just not exciting to me. So the thing doesn't really get much use unless I'm using it with my group. All right, so now we're moving to family radio service. This is designed for family communications, right? So think small uh, group, close environment, uh, very limited range, and uh, very limited uh, available frequencies to use. And this is uh, also a license-free service. It's licensed by rule. A little different than license-free, but it basically means you don't have to have an individual license as long as you're following the rules. Um, so again, this is easily accessible. Uh, you can go into Walmart and buy an FRS radio. It's the little booster pack radios that you see. Um, they have some, like I said, limited channels and they're very limited in power requirements. The other thing that's interesting is these are all shared also by GMRS, which I'll talk about next. Um, so uh, you can get, currently you can buy FRS slash GMRS radios. I'll show you that here in a second. Moving forward, those are no longer gonna be made because FRS you don't need a license for, GMRS you do. So it was getting confusing to people. They go into, I don't know, uh, REI and buy a FRS slash GMRS radio and they don't know that some of the channels they can use without a license, the others they do require a license. So they've split that out now. So moving forward, this is uh, July of 2018, moving forward, you're gonna find uh, harder and harder to get 
access to FRS slash GMRS combined radios because they don't, they don't allow them anymore. All right, so uh, operation, again, is a very small range. You're not allowed to have um, removable antennas. There's pre pretty severe limitations on power, but uh, it's a great option for go people out hiking around. It does work on the trail if you're like really close. If you're in a small convoy, I mean, less than a half a mile, right? For, uh, for FRS channels on the 500 milliwatts, uh, half a watt uh, range. So um, that's not very much to to use uh, but you know if you're tailgating each other then yeah that's probably plenty so uh, and then here's that little blurb about GMRS FRS dual service radios that basically as of 2017 they're no longer authorized so I'm not gonna get into too much into that but just know that FRS are those little blister packs uh, just like this all right so these are little FRS radios so this is pretty much typical for what you'd expect to find uh, in an FRS, they're basically the blister pack radios. You get them two in a plastic blister pack at Walmart or wherever. Uh, you can get these pretty much anywhere. These are Cobra Micro Talks. I got these actually for a wheeling trip. I went out with my buddy in Colorado and uh, he didn't have a CB. So this is an easy way to communicate with somebody because there's no license required for this. So I can go buy a couple of these put them all on the same channel, hand them out, and we can all communicate. And the range is limited, but again, uh, when you're out wheeling with somebody, you're usually not very far away anyway. So this is a great option uh, with no license requirements to be able to communicate. You'll almost always find they're very small like this, designed for hiking or backpacking or you know keeping track of your kids at the amusement park, that kind of stuff. All right, multi-use radio service. This one is on the list, but I don't think it's a real practical choice. Um, this is a uh, license by rule, which means you don't have to have a specific license as long as you follow the rules. But the rules are you will use a transmitter that is certified by the FCC for use on these frequencies. Now, there are only five MERS channels and uh, they actually have strange bandwidth requirements. So I'm not gonna get into this, it's a little bit too technical for this audience, but uh, these are non-standard uh, bandwidth allotments. What I'll tell you about uh, MERS is you basically are limited to two watts in power. You've got a few miles of range. You can uh, use an external antenna, which will get you 10 miles or more of range. You're not required to do station identification. You don't have to say your call sign or anything like that. But the problem is the transmitter must be certified by the FCC. There's a very small number of transmitters that are actually out there and available to use for MERS. Not a lot of people have them. So because of that, it doesn't become a practical solution because not very many people have these transmitters. So whereas Everybody can go in and get a CB radio or a FRS radio or even to a degree a GMRS radio. Getting a MERS radio is a little bit more challenging. They're just not very common. So I actually don't have one of those to show you. So yeah, I am not using MERS uh, radio service. So that's that. Now, general mobile radio service, I think is probably the best option for people to communicate on the trail or in an off-road environment that want some decent range but are willing to get a license. Let's talk about licensing. An FCC license is required to operate the GMRS system. It's a 10-year license and you don't have to take a test. It's basically a, I don't know, it's a red tape license. It's, it's a money maker. Anyway, so uh, all you have to do is go in and pay. I was 70 bucks at the FCC. You have the license for 10 years. I have a GMRS license, and I also have GMRS radios. Now, GMRS radios uh, have a lot more opportunities. Uh, let's talk about some of the, uh, the data. You've got a lot of channel allocations. Remember, some of them are shared with FRS, and uh, they have more traditional bandwidth allocations. You can do handheld, you can do mobile install. So the other challenge with this is you have to use a type accepted radio 
from the FCC. So there is a certification process and you need to use a radio to be legal that is certified. So even though you can take a ham radio, modify it to transmit on GMRS frequencies, even if you have a GMRS license, you're technically outside the confines of the rules, which makes your license invalid. So GMRS, you buy a GMRS radio, either a mobile or a handheld, and then you can use that to talk to people on a variety of these channels. And it works really well. By the way, your license, I didn't mention this before, uh, you and your family members, this kind of reminded me, it's a family, like so you and your immediate family can all share the same GMRS license. So that's something to consider. I think this, unfortunately, there is a license cost. Thankfully, it's just a 10-year, you know, $70 cost. But uh, this is probably the most logical solution for licensed communications that is above and beyond what you can get with a CB. Uh, you can get some significant range, whereas with the, uh, the CB, you're limited a little bit less than that. Plus, you have to share it with all the truckers. All right, this is a GMRS radio. This is the Midland GXT-1000P, and this is both an FRS and GMRS. It's got both channels. Remember, I told you originally you could buy combined FRS, GMRS radios. That's going away. This is one of the last ones, I guess. I picked this one out because it had really good reviews, a really good range. Uh, fairly decent power. I'll put a link in the video description, by the way, for all of these. So you can get a GMRS radio in a mobile install, which I didn't really want to do because I have enough installed stuff. And uh, the handheld can communicate with the mobiles. And yeah, um, they are actually pretty decent radios with pretty decent range. So I have two of these, and I also have a GMRS license from the FCC. So I can legally use this to communicate with anybody also using this same service. So because I have two, I can give one to my son. Now the GMRS license is usable by your immediate family members as well. So I don't have to have a separate license for my son CJ. I just give him a radio and then he and I can communicate legally when we're out and about. Plus we can communicate with other people who are also licensed GMRS users. Now my ham radio can be programmed to receive GMRS signals. So I can monitor GMRS frequencies with my ham radio, which I'll talk about next. I can also modify it to actually talk, transmit on those frequencies. Now that's outside the parameters of the GMRS licensing because that is not a FCC type accepted or certified device. And even though it meets all the technical requirements of GMRS communications, including wattage limitations, bandwidth, uh, all that stuff, it still will never be, at least under the current uh, law, it will never be permissible to use that to transmit to this, even if I have a GMRS license. And the reason is there's a little clause that says no amateur radio will be type accepted to operate on GMRS services. The reason is these are wild west, right? Amateur radios have very little hardware rules. So they don't want to try and figure out how to manage all of that. They're like, look, get a GMRS type accepted radio, you're good to go, anything else, eh, not. So could I use that and never get caught because I'm doing it responsibly, using the right power requirements, and, uh, and I have a radio that's well designed and doesn't interfere? I could totally use that all the time and nobody would probably ever know. Should I? Well, that's a different discussion. But I do have legitimate GMRS type accepted radios, and I am a GMRS license holder. So now we get into amateur radio service or ham radios. Uh, let's go right into licensing. This requires a amateur operator license from the FCC. This requires a knowledge test. There are several layers or levels of licensing. There's technician, general, extra. Um, I'm a general class license holder, uh, and uh, that gives me access to certain frequencies that I wouldn't have if I was just a technician class license. But for everything that we're talking about, a technician class license is just fine. UHF, VHF communications can be had with a technician's license. So this is a little bit tougher to get because you have to, like I said, go take a test. There are volunteer examiners. You show up at a testing facility, you take their test, you get, uh, you get a license from the FCC. The cool thing about this is it basically grants you access to the amateur frequencies 
But with that said, just because you have an amateur radio service license doesn't mean you can now communicate on GMRS or MERS or FRS or CB for that matter uh, using your fancy equipment. Uh, all of these have specific requirements. So having an amateur radio service license is not a solve all problems. Now you can talk on anything. You can talk more broadly on a lot of things, but you still have to follow the rules of the other communication services. So ham radio, very popular, the Bofangs, handhelds. Uh, let me show you some of this stuff and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. All right, ham radios. There's a lot of options here. Now I am a licensed amateur radio operator. I have a general class license. So I can go in and use this on the ham radio bands without uh, any legal issues. I can also illegally use this to transmit on business bands or GMRS bands or FRS bands. Um, so that is one of the pros and cons of this. Uh, if you know what you're doing and you know where the boundaries are and you make a conscious decision to either step over those or stay within them, uh, this could be a really great radio for a very cheap price. This is a Bofung GT3. Um, there's probably better radios out there now. I've had this for a couple of years. Uh, but it served me well and uh, is, a, is a great option for a budget ham radio. Now installed in the Jeep, I have this guy and it has a remote head so I can sort of show it to you. Uh, this is the ICOM ID5100. This is a powerful ham radio. This is a UHF VHF. Uh, it has uh, a lot of features and capabilities most people will never need. This is way overkill. If you just want communications, this, or if you want to do a mobile uh, UHF VHF, there's a lot of great smaller options that uh, are in the, you know, under $100 range or under $200 range. This is a little bit more um, involved. This is a digital D-Star uh, capable radio. This is for somebody who's interested in amateur radio as a hobby, right? So I got into amateur radio before I even got into jeeping. So amateur radio to me is a hobby in and of itself. So I got a radio that has some really amazing capabilities and I'll talk about this in a separate video. I've already done the install video on this if you haven't seen that. Um, but I like radio communications and amateur radio. Let me turn that off as a hobby. So um, that's probably overkill for most of you but that is how I would communicate with people using UHF, VHF. And like I said, I can convert that to communicate with GMRS and FRS if I choose to do so. But really for ham radio, a lot of people are gonna probably go these Bofang handhelds or some uh, more budget-minded uh, mobile install if you're looking at just for off-road communications. This is a five watt radio. The mobile installs tend to be about 50 watts or 25 watts generally. Um, so you can look at those options. All right, the last radio service I'm gonna talk about is private land mobile radio services. These are business radios. These are the race radios you see advertised from a variety of places. The frequency use is licensed for that company or business or entity that wants to use that frequency. So whenever you want to go and, uh, and, and get a, let's say you, you run a plumbing business and you want to dispatch out your plumbers to your customers, you want to use a radio communication service to do that or you're a taxi service or whatever, pick one. Your, your business is going to obtain a license for a specific frequency in your area, just geographically licensed. And once you do that, you're the authorized user of that frequency using radios that are type certified under FCC part 90, right? So they meet certain requirements and, uh, and the radio is, is certified by the FCC to be used on that frequency range and you have a license to use that frequency. That's how that works. Now, just because BF Goodrich goes and gets a license to use for their race operations and just because another uh, vendor sells radios that have that frequency pre-programmed in the radio does not give you authorization to use their license. Even if they say, we don't care if you use our license. 
they don't have the authority, first of all, to allow you to use it on a non Part 90 certified radio. So there's certain radios, you can, you can look them up in an FCC database that are authorized to use that frequency. They do not have the authorization to allow you to use it in your geographical location. So the same frequency that is allotted to BF Goodrich for race day in, I don't know, California, um, might be used by your local government in Kansas and might be used by a plumbing company in Florida and might be used by a taxi service in New York because there are these things called frequency coordinators that help make sure that these licenses are sort of spread out with at least a 20 to 40 mile distance between so that there's people not stepping on each other. Just because you get a radio that you have the ability to transmit and receive on a specific frequency doesn't give you the privilege to use it. Now, do people do it? Yes, they do it all the time. Are they gonna get caught? I don't know. But technically, if you buy a race radio and you use any of those pre-programmed business band, which are the private land mobile radio services frequencies, and you're not doing it in the same geographic location with permission from the license holder for that location, and you're not using a radio that is type accepted for that specific frequency range, then technically you're in violation of law. So look, that's not what everybody wants to hear because everybody wants to hear, go buy a race radio. You can use all these, oh, hey, BFG's using it. Uh, what about the, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. Look, I get it. I know people are doing it way in the thick off-roading where there's nobody around. You might not ever have a problem. But um, just know that that frequency is shared by a lot of people. Let me, uh, let me demonstrate this for you. The first thing I wanna do is um, race radio frequencies list. Let me pick, all right, so here's the weatherman uh, frequency. It's a pretty common race radio frequency. Uh, 151625. So I'm just picking that randomly because that's the first one I saw. I'm going to come in here, 151625, exact frequency. I want only active frequencies. And uh, let's show 100 matches. Um, search. So 151.625 is a weatherman frequency. It's sort of the, uh, the race, like, coordinator, organizer, it's where you go for help uh, or whatever, you know, these Baja races, it's sort of the main frequency, uh, which by the way, um, things that happen in Baja, Mexico are outside the realm of the FCC rules. All right, same frequency. All these are active status. So we're looking at that first, look at when they expire, 2022, uh, 23, 21, 25. Look at all the companies that are authorized to use this frequency. By the way, there are uh, 2,734 authorized license holders for this frequency. Now, we can take it a step further and um, let's look at the map. All right, so as you can see, there is a significant geographical disbursement of licensed users, businesses on this one specific frequency all across the United States. The question you have to ask yourself is, by using this where I live, what's the probability of me stepping on somebody else's legitimately licensed use? And yeah, so if you wanna research that before you use, um, I highly encourage it. The FCC has this great uh, universal licensing system search you can check out, but I just wanted to sort of demonstrate this and I thought this was the best way to do it. This isn't just a single frequency that has been allocated to the race radio use and you're good to go wherever you happen to use your race radio. It really is licensed to a lot of people with a sense of coordinated geographical separation. Now, as far as race radios, I don't have one. Um, I was gonna start there and then I started doing some research, figuring out where the boundaries were and where I wanted to be within them and I decided that's not where I wanted to go. Now, if I start wheeling with people that are communicating on those frequencies, then I'm gonna have to figure out how to do that. 
I can do that with this, but that wouldn't be legal uh, per the FCC rules that we just sort of went through. So again, these are a lot of decisions that you're gonna have to make and risks that you're gonna have to accept. But I currently do not own a, uh, a business band radio, a Type 90 accepted business radio, uh, or, uh, or a race radio or anything like that. Could I program this and use it? Yes. Could I program this and use it? Yes. So I'll make that decision when that time comes. Anyway, guys, that's it. Uh, this is a lot of information, probably well overwhelming for a lot of you, maybe really boring for most of you. But uh, my hopes is that those of you who are generally interested in learning what options are available, that this provides that for you. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one.